Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, it's political season in Egypt, and the media there are finding out what can or cannot be reported. We got our first look at the masked leader. Media-savvy rebels, the communications techniques of revolutionaries, and why reporters find their stories too good to resist. Television in bad taste. What's your name? How to lose your job in one minute or less. <laughs> and dancing in the rain. Hip hop meets ballet on the streets of California. Egypt is at the outset of a high stakes battle for power and the country's media are caught in the political crossfire. Less than a month to go now before parliamentary elections and in just one year's time, Egypt will hold only the second contested presidential election in its history. Its 82-year-old president, Hosni Mubarak, is not in the running for re-election, so theoretically the race should be wide open. But will that prove to be the case? In the past few weeks, we've seen a tightening of media controls. The newspapers, Al Sharouk and Al Dustur, have had prominent journalists removed. Private satellite channels like Orbit TV have been told to tone down their political commentary. And news outlets sending mobile text alerts have suddenly been told to apply for licenses to do so. Our starting point this week is Cairo, the rising political temperatures in one of the Arab world's most influential countries, and the conflict between those in power and the media outlets that are doing their best under difficult circumstances to report the story. Egypt is accused of cracking down on the media. This is an environment that is hostile to media, has always been. Now that we are entering one of the most crucial years in the history of modern Egypt, everybody is starting to feel the pressure. The brewing electoral storm. Egypt faces right now a very hot political moment. With Egyptian parliamentary elections in November just a few weeks away. This is a complicated story, but within it lies a simple, undeniable truth. The Egyptian media are losing some prominent opposition voices. The independent al Sharouk newspaper has suspended the columns of Hamdi Kandil and Ala al-Aswani, neither of them fans of the Mubarak government. The current affairs program, Cairo Today, and its opinionated host, Amr Adib, have been taken off the air by Orbit TV. And Ibrahim Issa, the high-profile editor of the Al Dastur newspaper, says he was fired for insisting on publishing a column by opposition figure Mohammed El Baradei. Issa's firing has been so controversial because he is that kind of that northern star in Egyptian opposition writing. As an editor, he was able to establish some sort of editorial direction at the newspaper that was beneficial to the opposition movement. He backed it up with solid writing. He was very, very popular, and this is what scared the authorities a lot about his work. What's happening now with Al Dustur newspaper, and indeed with some other uh, media outlets uh, in Egypt, is very much worrying, I have to say, because I'm part of this community in Egypt now, working for one of the privately owned uh, TV stations in Egypt. So yeah, there's something happening now in Egypt. Generally, the, the taboos in Egypt has uh, increased. You have um, uh, prohibited uh, area that journalists cannot uh, deal with, like particularly the military, anything related to military or intelligence, uh, religion. Sometimes when you cover something about religion or religious institution, you become prosecuted. And uh, in the same time, the president, the president and his family. Egyptian media did flourish for a brief period beginning in 2004, changes that roughly coincided with the invasion of Iraq and America's stated agenda of bringing democracy to the Middle East. The Mubarak government allowed for more opposition voices, particularly in print media. But since then, U.S. foreign policy has changed, and the Egyptian government's tolerance for dissent in the media has changed with it. It's difficult to see a role like that in 2005 when papers were much more open, the TV talk shows began to raise their yani, ceiling, as, as we put it. It's really difficult to say whether there is going to be this uh, crackdown as we come closer to the elections, or it's simply a series of uh, um, isolated events within a hostile atmosphere. 
although between 2004, 2007, media in Egypt uh, faced a, a wide margin of freedom, and the government was tolerant with uh, newspaper. I would say that after 2009, there is a wide backlash on human rights and public freedom in general in Egypt. So journalists become under attack, bloggers, private bloggers, and internet activists also face serious uh, threat from the government. It's not just about the government. Ibrahim Issa's former paper, Al Dastur, has come under new ownership, and new owners tend to want to make their mark. Egypt has many relatively new media outlets, and their owners often have their own personal agendas. Individual businessmen who have nothing to do with media industry and are there for the power. They, they, they're hoping that as the state media collapses, that they can become the opinion maker, uh, public opinion maker uh, of the country. So actually, journalists are beginning to go under double pressure. The traditional coming from the state, and then that now coming from the businessmen. And some of the responsibility for the position Egyptian journalists find themselves in lies with some journalists and the kind of work that they do. Yosri Fouda used to work for Al Jazeera Arabic before returning to work in Cairo two years ago. So many journalists in Egypt either don't know uh, basic ABC journalism, uh, or uh, they know it, but they, they use it to, for their own um, um, agenda. Um, there is a huge difference between journalism and activism. You'd probably uh, read a, a headline in a newspaper, for instance, uh, is Mr. Such and Such uh, a corrupt minister? Well, hello, if you don't know as a journalist, why are you asking me as a reader? Why don't you do your uh, homework first? So, by not really mastering your work as a journalist, first of all, you will always give ammunition to the state, to people in power. And this is one state in which the people in power have a history of using that ammunition against the media. And if the Egyptian media think they have it rough now before the parliamentary elections, just wait until next year when the presidency is up for grabs. Our Global Village Voices now on Egypt, politics, and the media. The Al Dastur saga comes as part of a much wider attempt to shut down alternative voices in the run-up to next month's parliamentary elections. And now SMS messaging looks set to be subject to new state controls, and it signals dangerous times ahead for anybody trying to speak with an alternative voice about Egypt's highly contested future. The most worrying element about the current crisis is that the crackdown on the media was not committed technically by the regime, it was committed by a liberal businessman and a head of a legal opposition party. So, freedom of expression today is not only under attack from the ruling party, but also it faces the threat of some liberal businessmen who are ready to play roles on behalf of the regime. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. It took a while, but Chinese state-run media have finally acknowledged that the jailed dissident Leo Xiaobo has won the Nobel Peace Prize. Initially, according to the Paris-based media watchdog organization Reporters Without Borders, Beijing blocked transmissions of foreign satellite channels as soon as Xiaobo's name was mentioned. However, in the Internet age, keeping news contained is never easy. Eventually, state-controlled Chinese newspapers reported the news, but in a critical context. They echoed the party line, criticizing the Nobel Committee and saying that the granting of the award exposed a growing phobia in the West over China's increasing wealth and power. Mr. Xiaobo is serving an 11-year prison sentence for his participation in the creation of Charter 08, a manifesto that calls for political reform. Blackberry addicts in the United Arab Emirates can breathe easier, or can they? A couple of months back, the UAE Telecom's regulator threatened to shut BlackBerry down if the makers of the device, the Canadian firm Research in Motion, did not come up with a way to allow the UAE's regulators to monitor encrypted data transmitted by BlackBerry users. The company, RIM, has said that the data was stored offshore, so agreeing to the government's demand was impossible. There was a long standoff, and then an 11th-hour agreement was reached. 
However, neither side wants to talk about the details. So while business people in the Gulf are happy that their Blackberries will still work there, Mobile Computing News, a UK publication, is suspicious of what kind of deal was made behind closed doors. If I was a Blackberry UAE user, the writer said, my privacy concerns would be dialed up significantly. People purchase Blackberry handsets under the auspice that their data will be cared for, and incidents like this where agreements are reached but the public are not told concern us. Bolivian newspapers are protesting against a new law in that country that would allow the government to shut down newspapers found guilty of racism. Various newspapers ran the same headline on their front page that read, There can be no democracy without freedom of expression. It was their last-ditch attempt to stop the legislation passing into law, and it failed. Bolivia's president is Evo Morales. He is of Aymara descent and is therefore the first elected leader in that country to have an Indian heritage. Morales said the law was intended to combat racism, not to censor the media, and that freedom of expression should not be used as a pretext for discrimination. Some newspapers say that they're concerned the authorities will take advantage of the legislation to shut down papers that they don't like. In the almost four years that we've been producing The Listening Post, we've reported on a lot of TV or radio hosts saying stupid things on the air. Um, so there's that. You can now add the name Paul Henry to that list. He is or was the host of a breakfast program on TVNZ in New Zealand. While talking about the Commonwealth Games in India, he found the name of one of the organizers, a Hindu, to be amusing. Well, it looks like Dick Shit. I know it does. Actually, the name is pronounced Dick Shit. But the host repeated his pronunciation eight times as though it was some sort of joke. <laughs> and then came his punchline. Anyway, and it's so appropriate because she's Indian. Well, the Indian government saying, protested, no. saying it strongly and unequivocally denounces the racist remarks. The TV host then resigned in disgrace, and the Kiwi Prime Minister, John Key, said he couldn't see the episode affecting relations between the two countries. He went on to say that people should recognize that broadcasters and commentators say things all over the world, and if we took offense to those comments all the time, we'd cease to have any diplomatic relations. We're back after the break with a look at rebels and revolutionaries and how they play the media like a fiddle. Welcome back. Here at the Listening Post, we often look at the ways that politicians and governments attempt to influence the way they are covered in the media. Press conferences, photo ops, exclusive one-on-one -on -one interviews are just a few tools of the trade. But those messaging techniques are not exclusively owned by those in power. They're also used by insurgents and revolutionaries all around the world. And their rebel movements tend to attract journalists like moths to a flame. For reporters, the allure of a David versus Goliath power struggle, the intrigue of clandestine movements in exotic lands, and the ever-present prospect of the use of violence, well, together those elements can prove irresistible. However, there are also some ethical questions involved that can lead the media into some dicey journalistic territory. The Listening Post's Jason Mohica now with a look at the symbiotic relationship between journalists and the media-savvy rebels they love to cover. Jordan, 1970. The Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine hijacks three planes, lands them in the desert, and calls a press conference. We wanted the captain and the, the stewardess to tell us about the sanitary conditions on the TWA plane, how things are. Would you like to smell? Yes, what do you yes. Think? I don't have water. What do you mean asking such a question? Reporters jockey for position, trying to get the best shots for their audience back home. Can we also shoot the planes? Please, you can shoot only the two planes. We have to realize that television is business. You can't survive as a television company or as a newspaper if you have no public. So what does the public want? The public wants the truth? I don't think so. The public wants entertainment? Yes, I think so. Is terror entertainment? Unfortunately, blood, weapons, adventure, entertainment. Did you see the planes explode? Yes, we saw them. We were about 200 yards away from them. The, the trucks even moved and they blew up. This wasn't the first time that a group of media-savvy rebels captured the world's attention and it certainly wouldn't be the last. In the decades that followed, the media operations of rebels, insurgents, terrorists, or whatever the media call them, have adopted PR techniques that mirror those of the elites that they rail against. 
governments and major corporations have extensive public relations operations and because they try to really shape the information environment in many different ways various social movements rebel groups insurgent groups try to do similar things they are proposing a certain interpretation of reality they are saying okay these are the problems and this is the way forward this is the way to overcome them even the most seasoned journalists have fallen under the spell of revolutionaries who took the concept of shaping the information environment to a whole new level. I was in Tunis with some other correspondents covering the uh, headquarters of the provisional government in exile of the Algerian revolution. And one night they told us they were going to take us on a raid into Algeria. We crawled through all sorts of barbed wire and explosions were going off all over the place. Of course, I wrote a story about how I'd managed to get behind the lines in Algeria, and we discovered at the end of the war, all that had been a fraudulent operation. It all took place inside Tunisia, but they managed to convince us that, that we were inside liberated Algeria. In the days before the internet, rebel groups relied on mainstream media to get their message out. So good relationships with reporters were essential. Because without a medium, there is no voice. And without a voice, you are standing on your own in the desert. So we have always had this, this teaming up with the news maker and the news gatherer. And the public thinks that this is all coincidence or the job of a journalist and it's all to do with integrity. Uh, while in fact, uh, the journalist uh, wants to become a star and the person on the other side wants to become a star. And for most journalists, there's no better status symbol than a sit down with America's public enemy number one. I can't imagine anyone turning down the opportunity of an interview with Osama bin Laden. Everybody would give their left arm to have an interview with Osama bin Laden. We are allowed about an hour and a half with bin Laden. We have submitted questions in advance. He agrees to answer most of them, but does not allow follow-up questions. Mr. bin Laden, you have declared a jihad against the United States. Can you tell us why? When an Al Jazeera reporter interviewed bin Laden in 2001, it was seen by the network's critics as evidence of its ties to Al-Qaeda. But for Western journalists like CNN's Peter Arnett and Peter Bergen, ABC's John Miller, and The Independent's Robert Fisk, it's been a feather in their cap. Let's talk a bit about Osama bin Laden, because unlike most of This us, guy is going to follow me around like <laughs> an albatross. Mr. Kajima, you're the only person who's interviewed him three times. Yeah, I know. Before bin Laden became the must-have interview, the guy to get was Subcomandante Marcos, leader of an indigenous uprising known as the Zapatistas. Inside an empty schoolhouse guarded by Zapatista guerrillas, we got our first look at the masked leader. Welcome to Mexico. When the Zapatistas captured the city of San Cristobal as part of their war on the Mexican state, they took control of the region's communication links. That meant two things. They were quickly able to interact with the global media, and they were able to project an image of power. They learned from their interactions with the media what sorts of issues, what sorts of framings were of interest to uh, international audiences. We want democracy. I mean, the right of the people to choose the government. In turn, the media especially uh, in the early years of the Zapatista Rebellion, was fascinated by the Zapatistas. And fascinated by Marcos himself. With his trademark attire and made-for-TV demeanor, the media were naturally drawn to him, just as they were in earlier years by the PLO's Yasser Arafat. I remember going to a huge meeting of uh, all the factions of the, the PLO and the Palestine, Palestinian organizations in Algiers, and the only one Arafat would shake hands with was the press. He couldn't care less about uh, officials or mayors or politicians or whatever. It was, hi Joe, hi John, hi Bill, um, you know, shaking hands, knowing that they were his allies. What was fascinating with the PLO is that they had kind of press secretaries. Their job was to find friends in the media. These techniques are not uh, something that belongs just to the rebels or terrorists. It's simply PR, common sense. I mean, it's about uh, getting the interest of your target audience and making a convincing argument. 
But even the most skillful arguments of the PLO, Zapatistas, or Al-Qaeda might have fallen on deaf ears had those movements not grabbed headlines through acts of violence. Without those dramatic deeds, those powerful images, fewer journalists would have reported on their causes. Fewer people would have heard their stories. But this is all part of, you know, why you become a journalist. You are curious to find out what motivates these people, who are they, what makes a terrorist in his head, in his vision, in his mission, and actually try to get into his brain. And the conclusion is you can't find out how they function because that's inherent of being a guerrilla or a terrorist. But for entertainment, for television, once again, it's a, they are great stories, and they know that. And finally, many of the videos of the week that we run tie into stories that we've covered on the program. But this week's is the exception. It's just a very cool piece of video shot on the rainy streets of Oakland, California. The dance group is called Turf Fines, and they stage what they call turf dancing, dance battles. Judge for yourselves if the filmmakers have sped up or slowed down some of the moves. But the video's gone viral. It's got well over a million hits on YouTube. And don't be surprised if the guy in the white T-shirt hits the big time soon. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post.